Welcome back to AP World Simplified, and today we'll be talking about Islam, which arose out of the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century CE. Now, Islam began with a prophet named Muhammad, who were believed by the Islamic people, or the Muslim people, to be the final prophet uh, for Allah, or the Arabic word for God. After receiving revelations from Allah, Muhammad wrote them down in what is known today as the Quran, or the fundamental codified document for the Islamic faith. Now, Muhammad and his followers would be initially persecuted, particularly in the city of Mecca, which is in the Arabian Peninsula due mostly to the fact that the political and economic corruption that had taken hold in Mecca did not have room for Muhammad and his beliefs, particularly those on almsgiving, which believed that people should share their money and profits with the poor. As a result, Muhammad would have to flee to Medina, another part of the Arabian Peninsula, where his followers would gather momentum and support and eventually go on a series of conquests and conquer most of what is today the Arabian Peninsula, spreading Islam throughout the Arab areas. Now, many of the fundamental beliefs of Islam can be reduced to the five pillars. The first of which being that Muhammad is the last prophet and Allah is the only God. Another being fasting, particularly in the month of Ramadan. Another being praying five times a day towards Mecca. Uh, a fourth one being that one should give to the poor or almsgiving. And a fifth being the Hajj or the pilgrimage, which is the idea that one needs to uh, take a pilgrimage or trip to Mecca, particularly to see the uh, Kaaba. Uh, if one is able in their lifetime. Now these beliefs were of course a syncretism of uh, local beliefs, particularly those of monotheistic religions of Zoroastrianism in the neighboring Persian Empire, as well as the uh, Jewish and Christian beliefs which also surrounded the Arabians in the Middle East. It's also a mix of uh, pre-Islamic Arabian uh, beliefs in the form of the Hajj, which was uh, a pilgrimage one must take to Mecca, particularly the Kaaba, which is that sort of black uh, box that's in Mecca. And that was a fundamental practice of pre-Islamic Arabia that was implemented into uh, Islam as a religion as well. Another principle established in the Quran was the idea of the Ummah, or the sort of Islamic community, all Islamic peoples, not particularly a state uh, or a political entity, but rather a community of religious believers. Now this Ummah that was intended to be protected and even spread uh, by military conquest in some cases, and the Arabs very much did so. Under uh, Muhammad, they're going to expand and conquer most of Arabia, and following the death of Muhammad, uh, the four caliphs would take over and continue expansion uh, conquering the Persian Empire, uh, chasing the Byzantine Empire out of the Middle East and Levant, and also conquering into Egypt and North Africa. Conquest would continue even after that uh, under the Umayyad Caliphate, after a, a, a tribe or group known as the Umayyad took over, and that would continue throughout the rest of North Africa into Spain, and it also continued, continued uh, past Persia into Central Asia to include the Turkic people, which will be important later uh, in AP world history. Now, after the Umayyad Caliphate had established the bulk of what was the conquest-based empire of the Arabs and Islam, uh, the Abbasid Caliphate would take over after a group known as the Abbasids are going to conquer and take over that uh, region. Now, while the Abbasid Caliphate won't be one centralized state, it will be essentially a group of individual kingdoms, principalities, and states within the territories spanning from Spain all the way to Central Asia that are going to declare loyalty to the Abbasids who are centered in Baghdad, their imperial capital. Now the Arab people themselves are going to spread into North Africa and the Middle East, bringing along with them their language and culture, as well as Islam, of course. That is known as the Arab migration, and that is also why you will notice that in the Middle East, Arabia, and North Africa, particularly more towards Egypt, you're going to see a high density of uh, Arab genealogy as well as Arab language and culture. Uh, Islam itself would continue to spread, however the Arabs actual reach and cultural uh, control would only extend to the North African and Middle Eastern areas, not into Persia or as much into Europe and Central Asia. Now there would be one other large bout of conquest based uh, conversion and that would be through the uh, conversion of the Turkic tribes that would later invade into the Indian subcontinent in the 13th century CE. That would be known as the Delhi Sultanate, and they would rule over mostly Hindu, but as well as uh, Sikh and other local Indian beliefs, or Indian subcontinent beliefs, uh, to form this Delhi Sultanate, which would last, last roughly three centuries, uh, going to the uh, 16th century CE. By trade, Islam is going to spread also to East Africa, West Africa, as well as reaching Southeast Asia and India. And they're going to do that because peoples within those areas are going to be you would say motivated or incentivized to convert in order to engage in more direct and beneficial trade with the Arabs uh, and the caliphates. And the reason why they would want to do that is the caliphates are going to, if you look on a map, control or be a part of 
every single old world trade network. Um, so all of the goods that are coming from the various corners of the old world are traveling through and are being traded by uh, Arab uh, and other merchants within these caliphates. Now the peoples of West Africa in particular are going to convert to uh, gain further trade benefits with the Arabs and the caliphates. But we're also going to have a diaspora or a moving of Muslim merchants within the Indian Ocean. And in these areas they would establish their mosques and trading posts and they became uh, economic centers for which lots of local peoples would want to trade with uh, at the added benefit too of converting. Now if they were to convert they would get more uh, trade benefits such as things like um, access to trade that may be not available to non-Muslims uh, or potentially first pick of goods or discounts for also being a Muslim person. Now these Muslim states, whether they be Arabic or Turkic or other, are going to establish a new type of government in this post-classical era. Uh, and the two options are going to be a caliphate or a sultanate. A caliphate, mostly Arab, are going to be ruled by a caliph, which is one that not only wields uh, political power, as they also are going to wield uh, religious and theological authority uh, and can interpret uh, or add to uh, religious writings uh, based on the Quran. Sultans, on the other hand, which are mostly non-Arabs, are going to be limited to uh, just political uh, authority. Now, they will be required to enforce religious law, Sharia law, as well within their states. They will not have the authority to uh, administer theological change uh, to interpretations of the Quran. Also worth noting, early on in the life of Islam is going to be its split uh, between two factions following the death of Muhammad. Now on one side we have the Sunni, which believed that uh, the caliphs were the ones that were supposed to take the reins of the uh, Ummah and, and Islam. Whereas some, uh, known as the Shia, believed that uh, Muhammad's brother-in-law and family should continue uh, as leaders of the Islamic faith. Now the Sunni and Shia would be at odds uh, throughout history, and also throughout history have killed thousands upon thousands and thousands of people uh, as various empires such as the future empires of the Ottoman and Safavid are going to face off mostly along the lines of theological differences that are continuing today that you can see in parts of Iran, Iraq, Pakistan and other places in the Middle East and Central Asia where the Sunni and Shia have a mixed population uh, that do not get along very well. Additionally within these caliphates and sultanates Islamic people would tolerate Christians and Jews. Uh, they would not persecute them per se, however, they would sort of demote them uh, to a status known as Tzimi status, which is a second-class citizen, one who does not have all of the political and economic rights that a Muslim person would. Now, while that doesn't directly persecute them or prevent them from being Christian or Jewish, it does um, provide them with an incentive for becoming Muslim, particularly that a non tzimi would have the right to not pay the jizya, which is a tax on non-Muslims. Regardless of one's status within the caliphates, the caliphates would experience a what is known as the Golden Age of Islam from roughly the 8th century to the 13th century CE, where uh, caliphates um, and sultanates were a part of or directly controlled many of the trade routes of the old world, greatly enriching the Muslim states, as well as exerting their influence religiously and spreading uh, Islam throughout Afro-Eurasia and even into Europe in parts. Additionally, the Golden Age of Islam would include the Islamic scholars elaborating on uh, and inventing their new new theories based on Greco-Roman and Indian math and science, uh, including things like algebra, uh, hospitals, diagnostic medicine, and traveling clinics. Now, while the Abbasid Caliphate itself would follow the Mongols in 1258, uh, Islam and the Muslim states would continue, particularly uh, under the rule of the Turks in the Ottoman Empire, as well as the Persians with the Safavid Empire, and in India under the Mughal Empire into the early modern era, which is where we will take our next look at Islam and the Muslim states uh, in AP World Simplified. That concludes this episode of AP World Simplified. And don't forget, if you're looking for access to all of my AP World videos, or other resources that can help out AP students or teachers, feel free to check out my website at morganapteaching.com. Thanks for watching.